It was 1917, and America was at war. Now, most Unitarians were for it, including the moderator of the American Unitarian Association, former U.S. President William Howard Taft. But some were not, and this minority included John Haynes Holmes, minister of one of our most prominent churches. War, said the Reverend Holmes, is never justifiable under any circumstances, and this means for me and for myself only can I speak that never will I take up arms against a foe. And if because of cowardice or madness, I do this awful thing, may God in his anger strike me dead ere I strike dead some brother from another land. This was his anti-war activism, 100% anti. And he feared it would cost him his job in his church where the majority was politically conservative. But he preached it from the pulpit. Nevertheless, on the Sunday morning that he did that, the response was stunned silence. Could have heard a pin drop. He left the pulpit thinking that he would never return. The next day, President Woodrow Wilson requested from Congress a declaration of war on Germany. That very evening, the board of John Haynes Holmes' church met to respond to their minister's anti-war stance. They took two votes. One was to unanimously condemn his position, declaring it dangerous, wrong-headed, even treasonous. The other vote, also unanimous, was that wrong-headed or not, their minister, John Haynes Holmes, had the obligation and had the right to speak his mind. He was their minister, and their minister he would remain. And that is a wonderful, beautiful moment in our history, a great example of, of our 500-plus-year-old tradition of the freedom of the pulpit and the freedom of the pew. And it's also a moment of high tension a moment of high tension suggestive of the many risks in preaching politics. And not just in situations of the minister preaching to congregants, but also in situations of congregant to congregant and back again preaching. Now, you don't have to be a minister to have something to say, for example, about the time he who shall not be named tweeted, he tweeted, it's freezing outside. Where the heck is global warming? He didn't say heck, actually. He's... Which is a little like saying, I ate today. Where the heck is world hunger? Just think about that. Whoever is doing the preaching, what, whatever politics are at issue, it's risky. That's what I want to talk about today. And I trust that the reasons are already clear why we would take that risk to begin with, despite the fact that politics for many people is, less po is a less popular topic than root canals <laughs> or head lice, we take the risk and we plunge headfirst into that topic because politics has to do with how communities give abstract concepts like freedom and justice concrete expression in the form of practices and laws. The French writer Charles Pagui once said, everything begins in mysticism and ends in politics. And it ought to be so. It ought to be so. We can preach inherent worth and dignity mysticism all day long, for example. But if we are not addressing certain things, like the Georgia legislature's recent so-called Liberty Bill, which was an attempt to legalize discrimination against LGBTQ people, well, well, what good are we if we're not talking about that stuff? Justice is what love looks like in public. That is what Cornell West said. If we are going to be love people, we got to be justice people. And so we take risks in preaching politics. Therefore, let us be wise. Forces are unleashed through political speech that is activist, aspirational, and individualist. Patterns are triggered. 
And if we are unaware of what is going on, we can get sucked into something that is nasty, that is ugly. Start with political speech that is activist. In the larger world, we hear pro versus anti ways of framing things all the time. Pro stances are activist visions of where we want to go, whereas anti stances are activist positions, visions of what we want to abolish, visions of oppressive things that are preventing us from getting to that better place. We hear both kinds of visions in political speech, and we can also hear a decided preference for one over the other, as in this quote from no less a figure than Mother Teresa. I was, she said, once asked why I don't participate in anti-war demonstrations. I said that I will never do that, but as soon as you have a pro-peace rally, I'll be there. That's what she said. Anti feels negative and therefore unhelpful. Focus on the anti, and the fear is that what's going to come back at you is just more anti. But pro, well, that gives us a path forward. It gives us a strategy. It gives us a plan. Now, this is the sort of argument another 20th century saint heard all the time, and I'm referring to Dr. King. He speaks to this at length in his letter from Birmingham jail. I must confess, he writes, that over the last years, I have been gravely disappointed with the white moderate. I've almost reached this regrettable conclusion that the Negro's great stumbling block in the stride for freedom is not the white citizen's counselor or the Ku Klux Klan, but the white moderate, who is more devoted to order than to justice, who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension, to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice, who constantly says, I agree with you in the goal that you seek, but I cannot agree with your methods of direct action, who paternalistically feels that he can set the timetable for another man's freedom who lives by a myth of time and who constantly advises the Negro to wait until a more convenient season. Dr. King was decidedly anti-racist. He saw his anti-racist activism as a positive piece which is the presence of justice. And he argued for it against what he describes variously as a devotion to order and a preference for a negative peace, which is the absence of tension. And clearly, Dr. King felt that an exclusively pro position was vastly unhelpful and incomplete. Negative, in fact. He calls that negative. But why? Well, because it makes him into an invisible man. Nothing of the, the real things he struggles with as a black person are included in the so-called pro-position which the white moderates favor. Just read the long passage that precedes his expression of frustration towards those white moderates. In that long passage, he itemizes all sorts of bad things that white people never experience, but black people experience all the time. He says, when you are harried by day and haunted by night by the fact that you are a Negro living constantly at a tiptoe stance, never quite knowing what to expect next, and plagued with inner fears and outer resentments when you are forever fighting a degenerating sense of nobodiness, nobodiness then you will understand why we find it difficult to wait. There comes a time when the cup of endurance runs over. Dr. King was an anti-racist because he wanted his political activism to reflect his real experience in the world. The bad things that he very definitely wanted to abolish, and unless he did so, he would stay stuck in the mud, stuck in the mire simply not capable of stepping forward into a better place. This is the difference 
between his activism and that of the white moderates for whom an exclusive pro position made perfect sense because where racism is concerned, their lives were untouched. They weren't the ones suffering. They weren't the ones being crushed. But some things have to stop in order for other things to go. And some of us know this more intimately and more completely than others. Unless we acknowledge the diversity in this room, the very same people that good intentioned whites want to help will feel left out or talked down to. They will feel more of that nobodiness that Dr. King talked about. They will be rendered invisible. And this by the very folks who are supposed to be their friends. It is a horrible pattern to get sucked into and it creates ugliness everywhere it happens. When someone's activism is anti, it is helpful to assume that there is a real story behind it. Pro is of course important. Pro is of course important, but not everybody can take the same path to it. Yes to Mother Teresa, but let's also remember Dr. King and his letter from Birmingham jail. It is risky preaching politics. Forces are unleashed Patterns are triggered. Consider a second way of preaching politics. Here the speech is not so much activist, but aspirational. The speech is about being a city on a hill or a light among nations. Do you recognize such language? It's what America has always said about itself. We have a special destiny to fulfill in the world. We are exceptional. Which is why political writer E.J. Dion says, fear of decline is one of the oldest American impulses. It is imposter syndrome fear. It is everywhere around us in this election season. Millions of people are wearing hats, and those hats say, make America great again, right? Millions of people are rallying around that sense of our country falling into disrepair, into decline. They're rallying around that call to action. Political speech that is aspirational has this can tend to have this shadow effect. And not just in the nation. The shadow can settle upon religious communities like ours as well, since we are deeply American in our aspirations. We are. I was reminded of the shadow effect several years ago at a Unitarian Universalist General Assembly. During the opening plenary, outgoing UUA president, Bill Sinkford, this was a while ago, reviewed the highlights of his administration's achievements, and part of this included a recitation of injustice after injustice in the world, which he enjoined the Unitarian Universalist communities to address. And then, during the opening worship that followed, he spoke of truth and reconciliation, and he formally apologized to representatives of local Indian tribes for what Unitarians did in the 19th century. Our complicity, bumbling though it was, if you know the history, super bumbling, but nevertheless, we were complicit in the US government's initiative to civilize the indigenous tribes of Utah and elsewhere. We were part of that. Now, by no means do I think that such an apology was unnecessary. By no means do I think that the evils of the world should go unchecked, but Something happened for me in that moment. Just the whole thing suddenly struck me as overly solemn, as overly earnest, as going overboard in the direction of self-critique and self and, and responsibility. This, this, this fear constantly that we are falling short, this fear, this fear, this, this sense of we've got to do more and more. We must do everything. It is America's fear, and it is our fear as a deeply American faith. So we must be overachievers. 
in the lead attacking every social ill. Theologically, it is not enough to become familiar with one world religious tradition. We gotta know them all. In addition to every liberal art and every science, soft and hard, our dreams have got to be the biggest. And if we're going to do diversity, well, well, we're going to do Noah's Ark diversity. <laughs> we're going to gather together two of every possible kind within our walls. To mosquitoes, to polar bears, to jellyfish, to alligators. And when we look around and we see something missing, <gasps> we self-flagellate. How bad we are, we're bad people. Fact is, we are aspiring to do something only a god could do. Only a god could gather two mosquitoes, two polar bears, two jellyfish, two alligators, two of every other kind of thing in one place and make that thing work. Only a god. And this god I am talking about is exactly the sort of god that most of us don't even believe in. <laughs> Yet unconsciously, in all our aspirationalism, we are demanding that mere mortals like ourselves step up and perform like him. Now maybe this is my unpopular John Haynes Holmes message for the day. Yet every time I hear a key Unitarian Universalist voice reciting a litany of all the evils in the world, together with the message that we gotta jump up and we gotta attack every one of those evils, we gotta do something, I just feel the weight I just feel the weight of what I want to call the Unitarian Universalist superego, which ironically can reduce our enthusiasm for bringing healing to the world rather than inspire it. Its effect can be counterproductive. It does not help. It casts a shadow over our real desires, our authentic desires to be a justice people, and it doesn't have to be that way. That is what I really want to say. We need to bring awareness to this, this fear of falling short. It manifests when we're just trying to do too many things. The imposter syndrome fear, it manifests when folks pick our beloved community apart and don't see that the good things outweigh the bad a hundred to one. I love this faith. We are a city on a hill religion. We are a religion that is a light among the nations. And I also believe fervently that we can be all this and still pace ourselves and still enjoy. I go back again and again to, to an image that, that comes from a colleague of mine, the Reverend Meg Barnhouse. She summons up this image when she needs it. It's the image of a surly waitress. She writes, in my life, I have certain things to take care of. My children, my relationships, my work, myself, one or two causes, that's it. Other things are not my table. I would go nuts if I tried to take care of everyone, if I tried to make everybody do the right thing, if I went through my life without ever learning how to say, sorry, that's not my table, hun. She's Southern, hun. I would burn out and I would be no good to anybody. I need to have a surly waitress inside myself that I can call on when it seems like everybody in the world is waving their coffee cup right in my face. My inner waitress looks over to them, keeping her six plates balanced and her feet moving, and she says, sorry, hon, not my table. Now that just feels healing. It makes for a saner way. Political speech that is aspirational can encourage hyper self-criticism and fear of failure. And the shadow pattern can emerge here in our midst as well. Patterns in the larger world are patterns here. And now, a third and last pattern we want to be mindful of. Political speech that is individualistic, as in, don't tread on me. Now, do you recall that? That's on a Revolutionary War flag. 
We, it reflects a mentality that's deep within the American DNA, a mentality that does not want to feel the burden of other people's opinions and other people's needs. The mentality is, I go my way and you go your way. It is why Americans typically prefer to complain anonymously to police when troubled by neighbors rather than risk face-to-face -face confrontation. Face-to-face -face confrontation implies taking a superior attitude which breaks the 11th, com you all know the 11th commandment? The 11th commandment, thou shalt not judge. The 11th commandment. I just kind of made that up, it's not really. <laughs> Some of you are looking concerned. Like, have I learned my history wrong, my theology wrong? Political conversations break the 11th commandment all the time. Someone says something political, and if we disagree, the instant response is to feel tread upon. Or we may agree, but imagine our neighbor's disagreement. And the mere imagination of that makes us feel uncomfortable, makes us feel awkward. If from this pulpit I have ever said something politics related and you felt I was being too pointed, you felt I was being too in your face. If this congregation has ever tried to take a collective stand about something and you felt like doing so was way out of line with Unitarian Universalism's emphasis on freedom of individual conscience, if so, if so, then you are in touch with the libertarian don't tread on me instinct that is deep in America and deep in our American faith. Which is why I can't possibly say that your feelings are wrong. I can't do that. But what is fair to say is that to be an American is to live within the tension of competing impulses. On the one hand is don't tread on me. On the other hand is government of the people, by the people, for the people. On the one hand is individualism, and on the other hand is community. From the very beginning of this nation, the very beginning of our religious uh, tradition, values of individuality and community have both been in play and in creative tension with each other. Bill Clinton memorably illustrated this by asking people to take a penny out of their pockets. On the one side, he'd say, next to Lincoln's portrait is a single word. Liberty. On the other side is our national motto. It says, e pluribus unum, out of many, one. It does not say, every man for himself. <laughs> this is the coin of our American realm, and it is the coin of this beloved community realm as well. It says, it means that as a country and as a faith tradition, we have to give, don't tread on me, it's due. And we have to understand that that's not the whole story. A competing value is equally important. Democracy, our fifth principle as Unitarian Universalists. This is why, in America, we form political parties, why we form interest groups, why we compromise on little things to get to the big thing. No one gets their way, that's why. This is why, in this congregation, we discuss and debate. We strive to hear different points of view. We even try to do it face to face. That's the best way to do it. We try to express our own opinions. We also take stands. Democracy is how we get things done as a civilized people. And we get what we work for. If we hang back, if we stay in our don't tread on me shells, if we refuse to be a part of the political process, well, it's just like the situation with Obama's choice for the Supreme Court, Merrick Garland. It is shameful. The whole system is jammed because some people don't want to play by the rules of democratic governance. I'm preaching politics today. We are preaching politics to each other. It doesn't matter that root canals or head lice can be more popular topics. Justice is what love looks like in public. We are a love and justice people, and America is in our blood. It is in our DNA. We Unitarian Universalists did not invent the language of pro and anti. We didn't invent a city on a hill language. We did not invent don't tread on me, but they nevertheless affect us deeply 
and we must be careful. The story of John Haynes Holmes, despite being intense, ended sweetly, and we want the same thing for ourselves. Amen.